Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ this morning as we begin our first series on the Tell Someone small group series. Of course, when you hear the phrase, tell someone, it begs the question, tell someone what? Well, if you're in a church, you're going to say the answer to that question is the gospel, of course. But then the next question is, well, what is the gospel? That's what we're going to take a look at today. Martin Luther in his small catechism says a couple things about the gospel. And one of the things that I want to emphasize this morning is his first statement. And that is that the gospel shows us what God has done and still does for our salvation. Get the idea here that the gospel is still working in our lives. It's not just something that took place 2,000 years on the cross of Calvary. It's happening today. It's happening for you. The gospel is something that God has done in the past as we look in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. After they fell into sin, they were experiencing a couple things they weren't created to experience. Number one, they were experiencing the fear of judgment. I mean, now God, who was a loving God, all of a sudden, after the sin, became a God that they could see as angry and wrathful because they've done something wrong. They were seeing another side of God that they never saw before, and they were scared. I know that it's the same thing that we've done as kids. We hide when we do something wrong. I'll never forget the experience with my brother that I would always, as a kid, jump on his back and he just got tired of it. So one day, he started pounding me back into the hallway drywall. And about the third or fourth, we are bigger boys now at this time, I said to my brother, Dave, stop. The wall is giving. And we went through it. And I said to Dave, what do we do now? We run, we run, we run. <laughs> so we, we ran away from home. We ran away from home. And about five minutes, I said to Dave, you know, I'm tired of running away from home. You think mom and dad are going to, shut up and just keep walking. <laughs> he was not wanting to see the wrath of mom and dad. Adam and Eve didn't want to see the wrath of the father either when they disobeyed. So they hid. They hid. We don't want to see that. We don't want to experience it in this world, but, but we do. We fear the great I am because of our sin. And we also experience death, which Adam and Eve were not created to experience. They are no longer with us. But despite their sin, God does something for them. He does gospel action for them. He confronts them about their sin, but then he offers a remedy. He says, from the seed of the woman, a child will be born that will crush the head of the serpent. God promises a house of salvation. He promises to complete it in his own way, in his own time, but at least he tells Adam and Eve, you have done something terrible, but don't worry, I got this covered. I am going to build a house of salvation and I will start with a foundation sometime in the near future. The devil used a woman to bring sin into the world. And God says, I will one-up the devil. I will use women to bring salvation into the world. I think this is one of the greatest things you can talk about when the gender wars get in discussion, that it is the seed of the woman from which salvation is brought not the seed of man. Already in Genesis 3.15, a virgin birth is promised. God promises to start laying the foundation of the house of salvation in the near future. And a few years later, the people of God were experiencing some other side effect of sin called slavery. That's not anything man was created to experience. But they experienced slavery for 400 years in the land of Egypt. 400 years. And they could not free themselves. But what they could not do, God could do for them. And God sends 10 plagues. And the 10th one is a horrendous one. Blood is shed in order for freedom. The firstborn 
of everyone who was not living in a home that was not covered by the blood of the Lamb would experience death. And understand the scripture here, the firstborn of Pharaoh had to die before Pharaoh would let his people go. So Pharaoh eventually is moved by this horrendous plague to let the people of Israel go, but he reconsiders. And he amasses his troops together to go recapture all this free employees that he's had to make Egypt great, but God again intervenes and delivers them through the washing of the Red Sea. The people of Israel get to walk through it, and all of their enemies are perished in it. And we see today in the Old Testament reading a statement that God makes for us. Maybe, you know, as we're talking about the gospel, you look at the Old Testament, maybe some gears are moving on in your head, and it's kind of like, you know, pastor usually tries to be thematic in sermons and services, and so why has he got all the Ten Commandments on there? That's kind of law. That's not much gospel there. But if you pay attention to the first verse or the first two verses, you will see there's gospel there. You know, the Hebrew word in Exodus 20, verse 1, is not commandments, it's word. It is the Hebrew word for dabar. Dabar means the word of God. So these are the ten words of God, but what is really interesting is that the first word is gospel. I, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you from the bondage of slavery. Gospel. And then God says, this is what I've done for you, and now this is what I would like you to do for me. The gospel, historical action, revealed in Exodus 20, God has done things for his people. And of course, the foundation is eventually laid, but the house is not yet complete. When Christ comes into this world and dies on that cross for you and for me, there the blood of Jesus Christ is shed for the sins of all the world. John 3, 16, the gospel in a nutshell. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Gospel in a nutshell. Jesus sheds his blood for us because we were not able to set ourselves free, not from slavery, but from the bondage of sin. And what again is impossible for us to do is not impossible with God. He becomes one of us offers himself as a perfect sacrifice for us his power in the blood to wash away our sins and to bring us back into fellowship for, with God for eternity in heaven. Power in the blood. Some years ago, I was sitting in a seminar where this one theologian at some other university or seminary was sharing with us, it wasn't the Lutheran uh, seminary, but they had this guest preacher, and one of the things that uh, our seminaries try to do is challenge their students to hear the other side and uh, be critical thinkers. So they brought this individual in who was really going to challenge critical thinking. And he was trying to explain Romans 11.26 to us. Romans 11.26 says, all Israel will be saved. And in his conversations with Jewish rabbis and his studies of the scripture, he came to this conclusion that if you have a trace of Jewish blood in you, you're going to heaven. So we all left the room and did DNA tests right then. No, we didn't. Because we took a step back and said, where is this guy coming from? And how does he make this statement? It is not the blood of Abraham that saves us. It's the blood of Jesus. We want to talk about being children of Abraham. We are not children of Abraham through being a physical descendant of him. We are children of Abraham by having the same faith that Abraham has in the foundation, in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is Luther's second point about the gospel. 
First one, it shows us what God has done and still does for our salvation. Number two, it shows us our Savior and the grace of God. Those are two statements Luther says in answering the question, what is the gospel? Now, of course, when we look at the rest of John 3, 16, this gospel requires faith, right? Whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Does that ever concern you? Are you ever wondering sometimes in life whether you believe good enough? Whether you got enough faith that when you die and close your eyes for the last time, everything's going to be good between you and God? Or do you still have that little fear of judgment that God had with Abraham, that Adam had with God. I suppose if we were to really be all honest with ourselves, we would probably have to admit that there are times in our life we doubt. It's, it's a reality of life. It's a reality of sin. We doubt God's promises. We doubt what God tells us. Adam and Eve doubted, right? I mean, that's the way the devil likes to work in our lives. When the devil was getting Eve to sin. How did he present the question? Did God really say? Can you not sometimes hear the voice of the devil speaking to you when you have your doubts? And when you read John 3.16 or hear John 3.16 proclaim, can you not sometimes hear in the midst of your mind or in your heart the devil saying, did God really say this? Is this going to be good enough for me? Do I really have the faith? Am I in trouble? But thanks be to God that we have a gracious and forgiving God, and it's true that doubt does not condemn us. Jesus doesn't say, whoever doubts me, I will deny. He says, whoever denies me, I will deny. So when you have doubts, don't let that bring to you a cover of darkness over your faith. It's a problem we have because we're sinners. And when you do have doubts, go back to John 3, 16, read the gospel in a nutshell. And I had this piece of advice given to me some years ago in college, which said, you know, when you read that verse, it says, for God so loved the world, take out the word world for a moment and put your name in there. For God so loved Jared that he gave his only begotten son for me. That just kind of assures me God has promised me salvation. He's laid the foundation. The house of salvation, totally not yet complete because we still have sin in our world. We still die. We still experience fear of judgment. One day the house will come be complete. God is still promising us salvation. God is working that salvation among us today. Luther, as he said, the gospel is what God still does for us. When we see children baptized or adults baptized, God is working salvation. When we hear the words of absolution from confession, God is working salvation. When we walk away from the sacrament of the altar, eating and drinking on the very body and blood of Christ, God is working salvation. What God does still does for our salvation, and that gospel shows us our Savior and the grace of God and gives us this faith that removes all doubt. For we look at this verse of believing in Christ, and sometimes we'll look at Ephesians 2, verse 8, and we as good Lutherans will stand up and say, we are saved by faith. But that's not what Ephesians 2, 8 says. Read it carefully. It says this, you are saved by grace through faith. Grace is the foundation of salvation. It's not anything we've done. And God, by his grace, gives you faith to believe in Jesus, to believe in the power of the blood, to have your sins washed away and be brought back into eternal fellowship with him. Faith, too, is a gift. Well, one more thing I have to share with you before I close in the message today is this gospel thing. Uh, there's a lot to say about personal life situations. And uh, I don't know, maybe in the second service this would be better, but I know in the first service I couldn't get by with it. Um, different cultures, different environments. 
So and first of all, I had prefaced my statement this way. Well, you know, since we're all Lutheran and we're all conditioned never to raise our hands in worship, I have to ask a question which no one's got to raise their hand to. So my question this morning is this. Throughout your life, raise your hand if you've never experienced conflict with anybody. No hands. <laughs> no hands. Ah, uh, 30 some years in the ministry, I have experienced conflict. And you see, I didn't raise my hand either. So how do I work through this when I have conflict? With people of the faith. Again, I go back to John 3, 16. And like I said, I substitute my name in for the place of the world. I substitute that name in the world for God to love the person I'm having a difficulty with. Think of it that way. I bet you you're going to look at that person entirely different. I know I do. I know I do. Hey, if Jesus had died for this person, this person is valuable to him, and this person needs to be valuable to me. Total different outlook on life. The gospel that Jesus has died for the world, even for those people we sometimes have problems with. It's a beautiful thing about this gospel of Jesus Christ. It gives us salvation, gives us a tool to work through our personal conflicts with one another. And so, as we wrap it up this morning, take a look at this gospel and just want to assure you this morning that because of what God has done for you, you have come to know and believe in the gospel. You have experienced the gospel in your life, and you're equipped to tell someone about the gospel. So what are you waiting for? Your world is waiting. In his name, amen.